These eddy fields are fantastic natural laboratories. They are large enough that we're able to conduct simultaneous measurements using autonomous vehicles, instruments profiling floats, microbiology measurements, chemistry measurements, geochemical measurements. These all come together so that we understand the living ecosystem of the eddy field. We're starting to put together slowly, really slowly, piece by piece, who are the major players in the cycling of elements on our planet. There's a lot different about what we're doing on this trip, and some of that is all this amazing array of instrumentation. It can be a little hard to coordinate a bunch of instruments right in the centroid of an eddy like this. Everybody kind of wants to be here. So, you know, last night at three in the morning, the center of the eddy started just shooting to the north, and we're trying to keep a constellation of robots moving with that water mass, and then the ship also wants to get in there and do some CTD casts, but not run over the really expensive robots. This has been a little bit more lively, to say the least. It is so difficult to study these ecosystems, right? To know how it's changed, you really have to have a good understanding of its natural variability. Looking at these places where life persists with very little resources is really interesting. Phytoplankton represent 50% of the global carbon assimilation, like the Amazon, all these big forests. They compare to microorganisms, what could be the size of not even a human hair. <laughs> what this eddy feature has done is taken this community of microorganisms and it's moved them higher up in the water column. So suddenly, organisms that were experiencing light levels from 0.1 to 0.5 percent and now receiving 1 to 3 percent. It suddenly means that they're able to fix more carbon. Who is fixing carbon and then who is eating carbon fixers? There's not one cell that looks like the next. They're probably going to be affected differently by the climate change. Some are sensitive to ocean acidification like this type of cells that are producing carbonate plates. Ocean acidification is reducing their ability to produce these plates. If you take a, an environment that's maybe, it's gonna change in some way, it's gonna get warmer, let's say. There's somewhere on Earth, there's an environment that exists that already looks like that. And if you can find those places and understand what's happening there, it can give a lot of insight into what challenges we might have in the future. It requires also a lot of experiment. Uh, we did not used to have this kind of technology to directly correlate the presence of these types of cells with ocean pH or carbonate system to see, oh, here they are limited because they lack nutrients, they lack carbonate, they like calcium or things like that. And now we can really try to map all the different species in the ocean and see if some of them are affected by different stressors in the environment. And the ocean is so vast and our need to understand it is so critical that we have to do something different. We have to use new technology. So these new AUVs are really taking a big part of my job, at least in the field, and putting it upon themselves. I can't quite keep up with the AUV, but I have to sleep at night. So I'm happy to have some automated process going through getting constant data. This really represents the first time that we've used autonomous underwater vehicles to detect, to track, to map, to sample these hydrographic features. Really using my old methods to compare with the new methods of the AUV. Ultimately, we hope to get the exact same results and consider the new AUVs a new colleague of mine. We'll be taking these samples back to the laboratory to interrogate them to understand microbial metabolism, microbial composition down in the lower sunlit waters. You know, for anyone that wants to find a science that still has some room for discovery, I'd say oceanography is it. 70% of our planet incredibly difficult to explore. The Earth is at a tipping point now. That's the challenge in front of us. And we have to believe that the processes that we're studying, the microbiology, the metabolism, has a role to play in this planetary survival.